So I'd just like to welcome you um, to SFU Gallery, and thank you very much for coming. Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Melanie O'Brien, and I'm the director of SFU Galleries. Um, and I just wanted to introduce um, today's event um, and by saying that I came to SFU three years ago. And uh, since that time, I've really grappled with SFU Gallery's location um, and context on this campus, on Burnaby Mountain, or on the hill, um, as it's alternatively known. And of course, we've considered the history of art at SFU since, since its inception, in, since 1965, um, a history that hasn't been confined to the studio or the gallery, but was often um, cited in the landscape around the university. Um, and I've also thought a great deal about the campus in relationship to art communities, um, both SFU SFU related and wider, and how this gallery in particular, this campus is quite isolated um, from the denser activities downtown and the fact that the SFU School for Community, uh, sorry, community sorry, the SFU School for Contemporary Arts uh, moved downtown. But of course, the longer history of this land's use and its haunted um, or haunting past is what we're going to turn our attention here to today. Um, and as I understand it, this land is the traditional hunting grounds for the Squamish, Tsleil-Waututh, and Musqueam peoples, and perhaps the Stolo. Um, and it was first logged in 1903 and turned into a Burnaby City Park in the 1950s. It was made part of SFU after the university been um, in 1965, and after the university had been open for 30 years, so that was in uh, 1995, they turned the land back over to the municipality and it became the um, uh, Burnaby Mountain Conservation Area. Um, and so, and most recently we've seen the struggle to stop the Trans Mountain Pipeline through the mountain. So this kind of layering of use is something that I think we're all thinking about here today. Um, of course, this brief history is entwined with the history of land across Canada, and it was with this in mind that I began to talk with Tara Hogue um, about her curatorial ideas and what kind of um, exhibition could take place at SFU Gallery that might address this as a site. Um, of course, the result is this exhibition, Unsettled Sites, um, a project that takes on questions of belonging or not. And I'd like to thank Tara very much uh, for her thoughtfulness and generosity of ideas and thank the artists for their work. Um, we're super lucky to have Tara, Marian, and Tanya with us here today to talk more about the exhibition. But before I turn it over to Tara, I'd like to note that the next event that will occur in relationship to this exhibition um, is a reading and walking tour of Burnaby Mountain with Cease Weiss and Adam Gold, and that will take place on Saturday, May 28th at 1 p.m. meeting here. Um, and uh, they're, they're going to discuss the intersections of indigenous plant knowledge and the Kinder Morgan, Tran Kinder Morgan Trans Mountain Pipeline protests. And then I would also just like to note that we have a walking tour of SFU's public art collection um, leaving at 3 o'clock uh, from the gallery that will be led by our collections man manager, Christina Headland, that's part of Jane's Walk. So unrelated to the exhibition, but I wanted to just let everybody know. So thank you so much, Tara, and uh, we look forward to the conversation. Yeah. Thanks, Melanie. Um, thank you all so much for being here today, and also a huge thank you to Melanie for inviting me to curate this project. Um, I want to also thank the staff at the gallery. Mandy Ginson put together an amazing annotated bibliography, which can just be found around the corner in the office space. Um, I want to thank Christina Headland for arranging safe passage of the works, among other things. Uh, Derek Brunin, uh, who helped us install the show and is a wizard at that. And uh, Neil Chung, who spent two days installing the posters using wheat paste on the construction hoarding outside. Uh, it's our disruption of the university's disrupting summer renos and uh, claiming of that space as an indigenous space. I'd also like to humbly acknowledge the unceded ancestral and traditional territories of the Coast Salish peoples. Uh, I thought a lot about the lands of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh when I was planning this exhibition. And I hope that the show reflects a considered engagement with place that dwells in the uncomfortable, the discordant, and the incommensurable nature of our shared experience of uh, colonialism. And by doing so, maybe to offer some alternative possibilities for encounter and connection. Um, I'd also like to thank Wanda Nanabush, uh, the third artist in the exhibition who can't be here uh, with us today. Her work as an artist, curator, organizer, and general trickster is 
always uh, an inspiration. The work that is included in the exhibition is called Carrying, which is a live stream taken from the security camera on top of her band's office on Christian Island in Ontario. However, what you're seeing today is not the actual live stream, but a looped recording of the live stream that was taken yesterday. And due to an unfortunate situation beyond all of our control, the security camera needed to go uh, undergo immediate maintenance and today was the only day that it could happen. <laughs> so, but I mean, it's actually kind of perfect because it does really speak to the nature of the technology that we're working with for this piece and its function as an integral part of the daily operations of, of the band um, versus sort of maybe our desire to consume it as, as an art object or an artwork. Um, but if you come back to the exhibition on May 28th, when we're doing the walking tour, you will be able to see it in its live uh, capacity. So I finally want to thank and welcome Marion Penner Bancroft and Tanya Willard, who have graciously agreed to speak uh, about their work today. Um, and we'll maybe begin with Marion. Um, when Marion and I first met to talk about the exhibition, we ended up having a really long conversation about our family history uh, and the fact that our families actually came from very similar places, were probably living in some of the same cities back east at the same time. And it made me think about uh, connections across both time and space beyond our direct experience of things and the way that we're implicated um, within broader histories. And I think this can be, is something that can be said about a lot of your work, um, which at the same time often begins from a really personal place. And I was wondering if that was maybe a starting point to talk about this series. Sure, it is. Um it's one of the ways that I've worked over the years is to start from where I actually am or how I identify the place where I'm living. And uh, I think I'm the first one in my immediate family to be born in British Columbia, but I've always experienced a certain kind of disconnect given that my cultural history uh, was really rooted in places like Scotland and Holland and mm -hmm. Russia, Ukraine, uh, Manitoba, <laughs> Saskatchewan. And so there was this always this kind of um, slightly discomforting feeling about being here and what did it mean to be physically located in a particular geography. And so one of the things that I've done in my work is that I went to Scotland, I went to Ukraine and Russia, I've been to Holland and Germany, all these places where my sort of cultural roots began. Uh, and then I also looked at the lives of my ancestors who came to Canada and in particular my mother's father who came from Scotland as a boy in 1884 to Manitoba. He went to school there, went to university there, ended up becoming a Presbyterian minister, and uh, took a job in 1913, when my mother was three, as a principal of the residential school in a little town called Bertle in western Manitoba. Uh, when I learned about this, it made me feel even more uncomfortable about the history of settlers coming to the country, this country, but having, having to leave their homes in Europe and Britain because of their relationship to the land and their lack of ownership of it or the fact that it was coveted by others. Uh, so here they came and did the same thing, basically. So if that isn't complicated, I don't know what is. Uh, so in the year 2000, I decided to go and visit the site of the residential school where my mother and her family had lived. Um, and I learned that 
what was standing there, which was a derelict building that had been closed in 1979, was built in 1930. And the school where my grandfather had been the principal had been torn down. But I found out where it had been. And these photographs are all made on the site of where that school had been, with that one piece of granite being the only evidence of it having ever stood there. The other evidence I could see was just in the way that the grasses uh, looked, which was completely unusual. There was a patch about, you know, not much bigger than the footprint of this gallery that uh, had these unusual patterns, looking so alive and as if animals or people or something had happened there. There were uh, as if they'd been sleeping or like animal fur or whatever. I was completely intrigued and also uh, quite stirred by my solo experience of being there. I was driving from Winnipeg to Saskatoon making photographs and had just attended uh, the funeral of uh, one of my aunts in Winnipeg. Um, I later learned, somebody who saw these said, oh, I know how those patterns emerged. It had to do with the way the snow melted and the, the, just the differentiated nature of the soil underneath. And the, of course, the soil underneath would have been disturbed by the fact that there was once this building there because it was about the size of the footprint of the school that had been there. Uh, so I've included as almost a title an image of my mother's family at the time um, with a bit of the map behind and you can see all these little towns dotted all these names like Bertel and Strathclair and Minnedosa and you know, it goes on and on. And, uh, and the two text pieces below, one of them is, uh, they're both taken from a local history of the town of Bertel. The town of Bertel got its name from the Birdtail River. And the Birdtail River was apparently named after an event that occurred, which was of a little boy, a little indigenous boy, reaching for the tail feathers of a bluebird and uh, reaching too far and drowning. The second uh, text is an account that my mother had of, of her few memories of, because she was from there from the age of three to six, of, uh, and the, the school itself. I've done some research on the school, and it was a school where many of the students were taught farming methods. This was seemed to be the the useful thing to do. And a little boy from the school had brought milk to my grandparents' house, which was adjacent to the school. And my mother was in, the, was in a wash tub having a bath. And my grandmother threw a coat over her. And so she huddled in the water while my grandmother gave cookies to the little boy who'd come to the door, which to me was a contrast in these two fates of, you know, one of privilege, not really in trouble, but feeling uncomfortable, while the, the first child had actually died. So to me, it was uh, maybe an, uh, quite an indirect way of looking at uh, the assumed privilege of the settler uh, culture relative to the dangers that were then imposed upon the uh, people who lived here, for, have lived here for, forever. There's, yeah. Yeah. Sorry, you. There's, a, there's kind of a tie-in also with Wanda's work that you might not be able to experience so directly at the opening. She tells a story about Nanabush and the ducks and how Nanabush tries to trick the ducks by tying rope to their feet and ends, he ends up um, hurting himself because the ducks fly into the air and he falls back to the earth. 
And it's this, this story about how Nana Bush keeps trying to basically eat the ducks, and the ducks end up winning in the end. So I thought that is kind of this, a good juxtaposition with the text pieces in your work. But um, Tanya and I have been working on a number of project, different projects over the past few years together. Um, and the work that you've done with Bush Gallery, which is a residency, as in residency, <laughs> uh, and uh, is a collective structure that's based in your own territory uh, and on land-based practices, has been really influential to my thinking about the responsibility of site-specific work, and I'm thinking of site-specificity in a really broad manner here. Um, but I was wondering if you could start by talking a little bit about the Haunted Hunted series, which are the works that are included in the exhibition in relation to Bush Gallery, and maybe in relation also to the research that you were doing around the Nanich exhibition, which is up at Presentation House Gallery right now, and some of the research actually kind of tied into um, Marion's family history in, in a really weird way. <laughs> awesome, yeah. Wow, yeah, I mean, I am interested in moments of synchronicity and there was kind of a totally crazy overlapping of things between working on the Nanich exhibition. Is this even on? Can I just talk? Maybe I can just talk with him. Yeah. Um, the, oh, oh, it's for that, right, sorry. The Nanich exhibition, it's got like, gotta wait. It's like a, anyway. Um, and I was, well, yeah, the works are coming from a few places. Um, one is this uh, residency in space called, that I called Bush Gallery that I work through, and it's a way for me to kind of locate myself and my practice back home uh, and not feel like I'm a sort of always dislocated traveling to cities where there is the infrastructure for us to gather and to put up shows in a gallery and um, you know, on, on many reservations that doesn't uh, exist in terms of like having a gallery space um, to have these kinds of conversations in places. And, and it might not need to exist also. Like it, it might not need, the, we might not need that kind of infrastructure. And so Bush Gallery is a kind of experimental place to work through those ideas. Um, but I did a curatorial residency in, in Kamloops and I was traveling back and forth on the highway a lot. And the highway uh, goes um, right sort of adjacent the river between Kamloops and Nisqanlith Reserve or Chase BC. And so uh, there's been uh, our ancestral remains. Uh, so some of our Kya'as, uh, Sla'as, our, our you know, great, great grandparents' remains have been found in putting in the highway. And so this is kind of like, this has been three or four years they've been twinning the highway. There was a number of protests we, that our people met and there was some cultural protocols put in place. It was decided by the community that the remains were not going to be moved. Um, and so when you drive by now, there's sort of a bunch of tarps um, and kind of constructed disturbed area and a sort of a, a concrete, um, shape uh, which is holding back the dirt for, um, for, this, uh, for this burial. And it's surrounded by um, bright orange construction fencing and there's also some prayer ties for people visiting the site. Uh, and so you won't, if you didn't know this, if you're not from the community or you didn't follow the news in the last few years, you wouldn't ever know that as you're traveling back and forth on the highway. And so I think it's sort of subtly influenced me in my work in the last few years. And so, and it came to a sort of uh, critical kind of synchronicity at this time of this exhibition because um, I was working uh, on Nanich, which is a, a, a work uh, exhibition at uh, Presentation House Gallery, which pulls from the Langman family collection of historical BC photography. And interestingly in that um, collection, we came across a residential school portrait from Bertel, um, Manitoba. and. I had, there had been this uh, exchange with Tara, she's curating the show um, that's, that's used that location. And anyway, and Marion will share the story later, but there's a, there's a connection there. And so um, for me, it's poignant uh, that this sort of indirect uh, wandering and interest and politically informed sort of ideas um, have these moments of, of synchronicity. And so I was really pleased to um, be in the exhibition and have that sort of come together in, in unusual ways. Um, but yeah, that, uh, maybe I'll get Marion a chance to tell that story. Sure. Yeah. Oh, just briefly. Really briefly. Uh, my, my grandfather was actually uh, a minister and not a teacher, but this is why he 
took the job was because it was a job. But the reason that the job had become available was because the former principal was asked to leave by some of the more conservative uh, elements in the Presbyterian Church, which generally was a little more open-minded than the Catholic Church and the Anglican Church in terms of ideas around education. However, there are a more dramatic example of this. Uh, this is an article written by a man who's looking at Presbyterian history and looking at this idea of crossing the wall of partition between natives and whites, this wall of partition as a Calvinist term. And a more dramatic example of crossing the wall of partition between natives and whites is the marriage of the Reverend W. McLaren to Suzette Blackbird. McLaren, principal of the Bertle Residential School in Manitoba from 1905 to 1913, arranged for Suzette Blackbird, a gifted senior student at Bertle, to attend the Ewart Training Home, a center training women interested in missionary service at home or overseas, located in Toronto for a year, 1909-1910. Shortly after Blackbird's return to Bertle, McLaren and Blackbird were married. An apartment was built in the school building so the McLarens could be close to the students. So, in fact, uh, Suzette Blackbird, who was Cree, was speaking Cree, the, the Cree language, with the students there, which the church did not approve of. And he was removed from his role of, as principal of the school, and he died in 1915, leaving his widow, to the best of our knowledge, and uh, without, it, without any children. Following his dismissal, he wrote to the chair of the Foreign Missions Commission, to say, I took a step further than many of my fellow Canadians and married a member of the Indian race. Sorry. Yeah. Some whose profession uh, should have taught them the essential quality of all peoples as followers of Christ have said and done things regarding this matter that have hurt more than anything that has been done to me. It is a poor lookout for the future of our church when the union of Christian peoples of different races is made a ground of offense. So Suzette Blackbird appears in this amazing portrait. Yeah, a large scale black and white portrait um, and Suzette Blackbird is one of, the, one of the women pictured. And so there was this really interesting moment um, Pre, yeah, before in advance of this exhibition of, of things coming together. Um, I guess in recognition of that, I just want to, uh, like, um, I'm not trying to sort of, uh, or thinking about um, ancestors and hauntings and spirits that I'm also wanting to be really responsible when I think about uh, that kind of thing and that I'm not... Um, trying to unsettle those ancestors, only unsettling the histories that maybe, um, that maybe make it so that we don't know those stories. And so I just wanted to you know, make sure to honor the different ancestors that might be, you know, that we're speaking to in some way and the stories that we might be speaking to in some way in this space and be responsible for that. And that's, that sort of brings in a sort of real pop culture side to this uh, body of work, which also looks at the um, trope of the Indian burial ground in pop, in, in pop culture. So um, one of the uh, well-known pop culture uses of it is in the movie Pet Cemetery, And so some of this work really plays with um, some of those ideas as well. Interestingly, in Pet Cemetery, um, it's the land itself that is sort of um, disturbed and it, it, in the movie it used to be a migma, or they say micmac in the movie, um, burial ground, but, um, but it's since the native people stopped uh, using it. Um, and so, and it's this idea of the ground is sour is the, uh, <laughs> but the movie also interestingly is also about a lot of anxiety around um, the death of children. Uh, anyway, so there's these different ways that things are sort of interlacing here when I read that, um, text uh, in, your, in your work, um, the ways that things are sort of uh, weaving their way through. But I did want to also acknowledge uh, Janine Freyna-Jutley and Peter Morin as, as sort of collaborators in Bush Gallery, as well as Gabe Hill, and um, that we, I'm sort of really interested in um, 
really collaborative uh, methods and means, and so the work arrives at a place um, also informed by people I'm working with in, in different ways and performed uh, and inferred by uh, things I'm working on, so. <laughs> Great, thank you. So we've got the posters out in the hallway that say Indian Hill are taken from the TV show Gotham, which is about the life of young Batman. You can watch it on Netflix. And Indian Hill is a site in the show that is a toxic waste dump built over an Indian burial ground. So, and Tanya's got a whole list of references uh, of movies that use this trope of the Indian burial ground that you can see uh, in the office next to her, next to her video work. So, uh, I think we'll leave it at there. Um, we can, can oh, of course. I just wanted to thank you oh. <laughs> for including me in this exhibition with these two fabulous women. It's such an honor for me to have this work part of this conversation and uh yeah means a huge amount to me thank you it's a it's an honor to same yeah. <laughs> yeah everyone for coming yeah. and for the gallery yeah. space and all those can great things continue to chat and eat cheese and olives yeah <laughs> thank you thank you